Nobody in America thinks about Asians when they think about race or racism. How do we, should we get involved in that discussion? How do we get involved in that? And so that was the beginning of a, a national civil rights movement to bring justice to Vincent Chin, but also to, to sort of bring into visibility and in the conversation about race in America to bring Asian Americans into that. Welcome to this episode of the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series. I'm Theo Gonzalez, past president of the Association for Asian American Studies and a former professor at the University of Hawaii. Our guest today is the unstoppable Helen Zia, author of landmark books in Asian American studies and a vital voice against anti-Asian racism and violence. Please welcome Helen Zia. Thank you, Theo. I'm just Thrilled to be here and um, thank you to the UH Manoa um, Ethnic Studies, all of the departments that were part of uh, inviting me to this um, uh, Better Tomorrow series. Um, and if I may, I would really love to thank Noele um, Kahanu for this beautiful, beautiful um, uh, Kukui Lei. And also I have an incredible Ohana in Hawaii, who and I know many of them are on here, so the pressure's on. I have to, I have to, you know, not make any bloopers. But it's thrilling to be here again, um, you know, with you, Theo, uh, and all of the amazing work you do at the Smithsonian. So thank you. Well, thank you, Helen. It, it really is lovely to see you, and I regret that it's also under these troubled circumstances. It's it's no exaggeration to say that. In our Asian American communities, uh, many are experiencing a mix of fear, mourning, and outrage in the wake of the Atlanta killings and too many other incidents. Um, so before we begin, I'd like you and everyone who's with us on this webcast to acknowledge the lives that have been lost, as well as the family members and friends and coworkers who live on through this tragedy. Um, we hold them in our thoughts today. So Helen, um, you've been speaking in several venues recently, and no doubt the context of anti-Asian violence, violence against women and attacks on seniors is now part of everyday fears along with the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about your reactions to the news that came out of Georgia just last month? Well, I think along with everybody else, it was just shock and horror um, but I have to say very sadly, I was, you know, not surprised. Um, you know, for Asian Americans, certainly on, on the mainland, but, you know, actually Asians around the world, because this is a global, um, a, a global pandemic of racism and hate directed at people who look Asian. Um, you know, this whole pandemic, you know, it's a dual pandemic of the virus, but also of the hate. It really began in, you know, December 2019. You know, um, many um, activists, people who have been following, um, following events and uh, issues in the Asian American community, such as yourself, I mean, people were already talking about, um, you know, history has shown not just modern history, but going hundreds of years of Asians being on this continent of, of North America, just knowing that um, scapegoating, targeting, ethnic cleansing, including violence has really been part of the heritage. And, you know, as just a decade ago, during all of the Islamophobia that has not gone away, um, there was a mass killing of, of South Asian Sikh Americans. And so, um, and I, I guess I just have to say, um, it's not over yet. We know from history that, uh, you know, there's no economist who is, has said when they think this is going to end. And it's a global economic crisis, as well as nobody knows when the pandemic and it is going to end. And when people are suffering and miserable and in crisis, some people want to uh, take it out on others. And we know just from our history 
that Asian Americans often take the brunt of that. And especially with, you know, the, uh, all of the uh, hateful rhetoric that hasn't gone away either in some quarters, um, you know, the, the blaming of people who look Chinese, as well as the never ending war against terror just basically puts all Asians at risk. And that's what we're seeing today. And that's the terror, you know, of what we saw in Atlanta. And it, it does feel, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I hope I'm not the only one that's, that's registering this, but does it feel to you as if that it's, that this is a, a, a different kind of trauma or is it just more palpable? Um, it, it does lead us to think about how we can respond to this. Um, and, and certainly one kind of response is just paralysis, you know, and it's not just that, it's not that different from any other kind of shock to the system where you really have no idea how to respond. Um, and how are, how are you seeing Asian American communities in different parts of the country react to this kind of trauma uh, as, um, as you've had a chance to talk with them? A lot of people, of course, are very afraid. You know, the country is opening up. People have to go to work and many have to take public transportation. Of course, the essential workers among, you know, Asian Americans have already been registering these things, you know, nurses and doctors and, and uh, people who work in home health care. They've already been on the streets and, and have reported on their way to go save people's lives. They've been under attack. We know that, um, you know, one out of every three nurses who has died from COVID has been a Filipina nurse. And so, you know, the effect on our community has been very frightening. Um, children are, you know, about to go to school. Some are already, parents are terrified, not to mention, you know, our seniors just to go out and take a walk. Uh, you have to worry about, you know, our elders, um, what they may face. So I think you're right. There's a lot of feeling like, you know, hunkering down. I'm, I've heard that, you know, in some school districts, they're really afraid that, that the Asian kids are not gonna show up because parents are too afraid to let the kids go to school. And I think though, once beyond the feeling of fear, people, there's a, a large recognition that we have to do something about it. Um, online, there's been a lot of activity, but there are, you know, so many, Asian advocacy groups out there now who are really just, you know, working 24 seven to figure out how to um, um, not just talk about safety, but looking at the larger, um, the larger issue of violence and, you know, Black Lives Matter and issues of systemic racism and, um, you know, institutional uh, oppression that exists in our society. I mean, we have police chiefs talking about systemic racism. When, when did I, I never imagined that actually from my right. young activist days. So, so there's a lot of discussion and activity going on about what can be done and reaching out and trying to, to really build a community response because it does feel different. I mean, in all of my years as an activist, and having been involved in a, you know, different movements like the Vincent Chin case around mm -hmm. anti-Asian violence, um, I have to say this feels more intense. It feels um, like when, it, when will there be a turning point? I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but a, as an activist, we know that doing nothing is not an alternative. And at some point, as you know, there are a lot of historians, I think, who are, who are part of, of this program um, as well. You know, the pendulum does swing at some point. You know, the arc of history bends toward justice, but it has to be we help it bend. We help the pendulum swing. We get ready to uh, take action so that we know when those moments um, where we can really make a big difference that we're ready for it. So I think there's a lot of organizing that's taking place. And, and that's mm -hmm. part of our history too. The mm -hmm. resistance and the activism that's happened, you know, for Asian Americans for as long as, you know, the, um, as long as we've been here responding to mm -hmm. things like the Chinese Exclusion Act or the Page Act or the, you know, the, the internment of Japanese Americans or any number of other things that we can list. There has also been an organized resistance to that. And, and, and for those who are not sure what to do, but, and don't feel powerless. 
you know, the whole thing is, you know, there are more than 22 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States right now, and probably more than that. And so we really do have, you know, the numbers where we can make a difference. And so this is a time to start, you know, flexing those organizations, raising our voices, because we can do something about it. We don't just have to uh, stand back and, you know, hide in our pods or, um, you know, just watch in horror. There really are things we can do. Right. Right. Well, it, it, and, you know, I've got you for the full hour. So we're, we're going to get a chance to talk about um, the things that are happening on the ground, how we can connect Asian American to other uh, kinds of campaigns and movements and actions. Um, but since you mentioned the Vincent Chin case, I'd like for us to be able to step back a bit and kind of think about how we got there, not, in, not only in terms of earlier notions of, of um, anti-Asian violence, and, and with that case, it's a classic one, or it's become a, a classic one taught, especially in Asian American and ethnic studies classes. Um, but I'd like for us to chat a little bit about your involvement with that case, because for, for many, it's, it's probably something that's not very well understood. It happened in 1982. There was a fantastic documentary that's become a staple of Asian American and ethnic studies classes um, and, uh, called Who Killed Vincent Chin? So I'd, I'd like free to talk about uh, that particular case because it's really captured the imagination about not only the, the shock uh, of, of what can be done in the name of anti in the name of Asian violence, um, but also the kind of organizing that takes place as a direct response to it and something that had not really existed before, especially in Detroit. Um, so Helen, could you talk about about your coming to Detroit in um, when was that in 81 or 82? No, I actually um, went to Detroit in the late 1970s, probably wow. around 1977. Okay. And, um, and that was after I quit medical school. So um, um, some of the people might know that I, um, you know, I'm a, a, the daughter of Chinese immigrants. My parents, um, you know, there were six kids. We um, made things in our house that my father sold. I mean, that to me was, that was what business was. And I didn't want to have any part of it because us kids, as soon as we had any manual dexterity, we were part of the family, you know, um, labor. Yeah, we were child labor in the family and, and dad would load up the car and sell the things we made to flower shops. And somehow he actually made a living doing that. And I knew that that was not, you know, a future I wanted. Um, especially because we had a very, very traditional, you know, um, Chinese Confucian patriarchal uh, family. So, so as a girl, I knew freedom for me would be to go to college. And so um, I knew I had to get a scholarship to go to college. I, you know, worked as hard as I could to get a scholarship and I did. And, uh, but that was my goal. Beyond that, I had no idea what I would do in life. I was actually a very, you know, shy, Asian girl and uh, I changed, but um, I was very afraid to even stand up and talk. And that was a terrifying thought to me. So the p possible jobs available to me were uh, business, uh, lawyer, teacher, or doctor. Those were the only mm -hmm. things, you know, in the new immigrant imagination that I could imagine. And uh, speaking was out of the question. So, and business, so that left doctor. So um, I, took pre-med classes, the minimum that I could, and the rest of the time, um, you know, was studying public affairs, you know, uh, um, public and international affairs. Uh, we had student-initiated Asian uh, American studies classes, trying to learn about history and economics and social change, got very active, um, but I ended up getting accepted to medical school, which I found out almost right away was a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but having gotten there, uh, my immigrant parents were like, oh, Helen, you'll take care of us when we're old. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that kept me from just like quitting right off the bat, um, that hope that my parents saw in me. And after about two years of that and spending most of my medical school time doing community organizing anyway, um, I just realized I, I couldn't get through the, the, the four years. And I 
got my parents quite upset by telling them I, I can't go back. Um, but here's the thing, and, and I know there may be a lot of students watching that, you know, we're life is a journey that we're on and, and we ourselves are the, you know, the captains of our journeys. We can't live for the expectations of, of anybody else. And in fact, nobody wants a doctor who is a miserable, unhappy person. You wouldn't want that doctor to do your surgery. And so, right. And so I had to tell, you know, I, I quit. And then um, some friends said, if you really want to know about organizing in America and social change in America, you should go to the heartland of America. And that rang a bell with me. You know, I thought, yeah. And somebody said, Detroit, you can get a job in the auto industry, which at the time was still booming. And sure enough, I packed up my car. My parents already thought I was crazy for quitting medical school. So it was just like another crazy thing that I was doing to then go to Detroit and really within a few weeks, I actually did get a job in the auto industry um, as an auto worker, uh, stamping out um, metal car parts, you know, steel and, um, and doing that heavy work for a couple of years, you know, really learning about people who were unlike me, a city and an industry that, you know, was um, majority African-American, uh, a lot of Arab workers, you know, uh, white workers from uh, Appalachia who were in the auto industry. And um, I learned a lot of things that had I thought that I might become a writer one day, it, it was perfect actually to really see, you know, what motivates people to come to really, you know, work so hard and kind of thankless work, dangerous work. And like the other, you know, millions of auto workers and people associated with the auto industry, I got laid off. I got laid off in the late 70s. There were, um, for, for those who remember, there were um, a severe uh, oil, there was a severe oil crisis, actually two of them. And, um, you know, threats of going to war with different uh, Middle Eastern countries and the auto industry collapsed. And not only did the auto industry collapse, all of manufacturing actually in, in the United States s stopped, you know, and uh, these were generally pretty, you know, high paying jobs for blue collar um, work. And so um, sooner or later, everybody arrived at who do you blame at a time of crisis? And it was an, a terrible economic crisis. Uh, throughout the United States, there was a recession that lasted a number of years and well into the 1980s. And in the Midwest, you know, when I was in Detroit, there was a, a terrible depression. People were, you know, the unemployment lines would wrap around the blocks for, you know, and if you could get to the front of the line, you were lucky to get $90 to last you for um, a, a couple of weeks. And so anyway, I was part of that. And I felt just, you could feel how much frustration and misery and suffering that people were going through. And um, who did they blame? They blamed Japan. Japan was at fault for America's problems, the economic crisis, the collapse of the industry. Why? Because Japan knew how to make fuel efficient, um, qu high quality cars. Whereas the Detroit dinosaurs of those days got maybe seven or eight or nine miles a gallon and nobody could afford to drive them anymore. Um, so Japan and anybody who looked Japanese was blamed and you could feel that, you know, you had a target on the back of your head and anybody who drove uh, a Japanese made car could get shot at on the freeway. So it was, the hatred was just, you could cut it with a knife. And so, um, the other thing is that of course, Germany made uh, very fuel efficient cars too, that were highly popular. But, you know, racism doesn't work if the people, you know, look like you. Um, so, you know, like the majority of Americans. So Japan became the scapegoat and anybody who looked Japanese was uh, a target. And one day what we all felt could have happened was a Chinese American named Vincent Chin was killed by two auto workers who saw him at his bachelor party at a pretty sleazy bar and said, it's because of you mother Fs that we're out of work and uh, tracked him down, stalked him through the streets of Detroit and um, 
beat his brains out into the street with a baseball bat. And that would have been terrible enough. But the, um, the judge took a look at these two white, you know, in court, clean cut auto workers. There were no question that they had done it. It was witnessed by dozens of people and said, you're not the kind of men who should go to jail. And um, the city of Detroit erupted because, you know, a majority black city, who are the kind of people who go to jail then for beating somebody to death with a baseball bat? And there was no question in anybody's mind had, had, had an Asian person beaten a white person to death that, you know, with a baseball bat, they'd be in jail and certainly a black person as well. And so um, there was an outcry, but for the Asian American community, and it might be hard for people now in the, you know, 2021 to, to, to even think about a time when Asian Americans didn't even consider themselves Asian American. It was not a term that was widely adopted. People identified as their ethnic, you know, I'm Chinese, I'm Japanese, and you know, uh, Korean, Filipino, um, Vietnamese, Indian, and that would be how they were organized, how they lived in their different cultural organizations. So what happened was the, you know, the very small community of different Pan-Asian ethnicities came together and said, you know what, what happened to Vincent Chin could be um, any one of us, you know, anybody, could be a target. And then the killers have, you know, get off scot-free. So it was really the moment when uh, different Asian ethnicities came together to say, what can we do about this? What do we do in a society where when you think about racism, it's only about black and white. And people actually said that they would say race in America, it's just black and white. And you'd go, well, you know, where do Asians fit in? And as we started organizing, there was the question of, well, we don't, nobody in America thinks about Asians when they think about race or racism. How do we, should we get involved in that discussion? How do we get involved in that? And so that was the beginning of a, a national civil rights movement to bring justice to Vincent Chin, but also to, to sort of bring into visibility and in the conversation about race in America to bring Asian Americans into that. and you know, to have um, a, the idea of a Pan-Asian movement and a Pan-Asian voice. So that was the beginning of a lot of things. And when I look at today, the kind of, the way, um, even after Atlanta and the mass killings in Atlanta, where this, the, the, the killer drove around for quite a while, targeting Asian businesses, targeting Asian American women, the first, you know, the first thing that the police say at the, um, press conferences, oh, it has nothing to do with race. And that was also the attitude, you know, in Detroit. And part of the organizing was we had to establish and do Asian American History 101 every time we, um, you know, we talked about the what happened to Vincent Chin so that they, they would realize that we're part of this democracy too. So I'm sorry, that's the long answer. Well, the, the short but long answer to what the Vincent Chin case, um, you know, almost 40 years ago was about, but right. yeah. what happened well, then I, is I, happening now too. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, uh, anyone on this webcast should really take a, a moment to try to look up um, uh, Helen's excellent book from 2000 uh, called Asian American Dreams. And there's a fantastic chapter where she summarizes the details. Of, and of course, there are many that are not in that documentary, uh, called Who Killed Vincent Chin, but, but your own um, understanding of it, especially from a ground view of what it means to organize um, a longstanding but also reluctant Chinese community in Detroit. Um, that was for many years, kind of uh, in the shadows for, for many, many years. And then having to, to think Pan-Asianly in, in a Pan-Asian sense, um, and then also to think cross-racially, to think with other uh, racial groups, uh, African-American and others, to truly kind of put the bones on what it means to live in a coalition. Um, it was, um, it's really a stunning um, set of histories to, to think about. And, and also the, those lessons really allow us to, to understand um, history, if, even if we can step back a little bit further uh, from that to understand that in, in your book, Asian American Dreams, again, you devote an entire chapter to thinking about that long arc 
of Asian American history in a very global frame. And I think this is probably what surprises a lot of uh, people, especially Americans who are not very well versed in Asian American history. They probably think that it's a post-1965 phenomenon. Uh, when in fact, you, you probably, even if you started in 1865, you're, you're, you're still having to catch up to another century of history. Um, can you talk about what that means for you to, to think about this, this global frame of Asians coming to the West uh, when it's also really about the West going to Asia um, centuries ago? Right, right. I mean, what was uh, Christopher Columbus looking for anyway? You know, he thought he had hit the path to, to, um, to Asia and, um, you know, the Spice Islands and all of that. And I mean, for me, as an Asian American girl growing up in New Jersey, you know, and at, at a time when there were really very few uh, Asian Americans outside of ghettos with names like Chinatown or Little Manila or, you know, uh, Little Tokyo and, um, and the state of Hawaii, you know, other than that, in the other spaces uh, of America, you really didn't see yourself that much. And I, you know, and it, it does something when you're also so invisible and you actually see nothing of your history there. You don't know that there were, you know, Asian American and Pacific Islanders who fought in the Civil War. You know, you don't know, like, where did we come from? Everybody says to me, go back where you came from. And I have to say, oh, you mean New Jersey? Well, I don't want to go back there. And, um, you know, I would walk around and just wonder, you know, did who walked on these, you know, this ground before me, were there any other Asian Americans? I cannot be the first one. And as I began to look into that and to see, wow, our history really does go far back. You know, 1825, the first uh, Chinese American was recorded being born in New York City. His name, he was named Willie Brown. So if you were just to look at race or ethnicity, you wouldn't find him, right? There's Willie Brown, but 1825, but it goes even farther than that. I mean, the um, Spanish um, Manila, Spanish Manila galleon trade, you know, that began in the 1500s um, really had, you know, Filipinos on ships, you, you know, um, guiding because they were such a good seafarers uh, ending up in North America. And, uh, you know, there are settlements of like, you can find 10th generation Filipino Americans who are descendants of these Spanish galleon um, uh, uh, seafarers. And that's also true for Pacific Islanders. I mean, in the days that uh, Hawaii was known as the Sandwich Islands, I mean, you look at the muster rolls of, of the Civil War, you find names of Pacific Islanders who were there in the 1800s. And, um, you know, there are, there are towns and counties and streets on the West Coast of America with names like Samoa, you know, and it's like, why do they have that name? Well, it's because there were Pacific Islanders, you know, who were also, um, and Polynesians who were incredible, um, you know, navigators who helped these, you know, settler explorers find their way across the Pacific. So, um, so the more I found out about this, and it's all part of the global migrations, it's all part of you know, imperialism and capitalism about finding places to extract resources from uh, you know, the Pacific Islands, from other countries, from other people, and the international trade that took place then, including the human trafficking that took place with slavery and, and with indentured of people who are kidnapped, you know, from, from different parts of Asia to, to work, you know, yeah. in different yeah. sugar plantations or, or elsewhere. So right. that, that was a discovery for me because like most, um, most Americans, even today, I knew nothing about my own history, you know, the, the history of Asians in America. And so it was really a discovery. And I, I really wanted to put that in, in that book so that, so that other people wouldn't be as deprived as I felt that I had been. You know, it really made a difference for me to think, yeah, I'm walking here, you know, in a, in a place where nobody thinks there had been another Asian person. And in fact, for hundreds of years, there had been people. So um, that's what I was trying to convey there. 
it's also relational because it's 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 also in addition to kind of thinking about where have we walked before where have we been before the idea of asians in the americas is nothing new and um, especially when you know as you say it's re- it can be related to the to the ending of the african slave trade in the early 1800s and the importation of labor from south asia and china to the americas all throughout the caribbean and you have this notion of replacement labor that becomes, again, re- relational with Asian and African labor. We're sharing the same structural locations all throughout the hemisphere. And so I, I think it's, it, it becomes um, an in- incredible lesson for teachers and for students to think about, you know, what is the United States? It's not enough to study the United States as it's, as in, it, in, in isolation. And we really have to kind of think about hemispherical history, uh, about how millions of people are coming to the hemisphere we're South Asian, we're Chinese, we're finding themselves in Cuba, we're finding themselves all throughout the Caribbean, and they're leaving their marks in all the interesting spaces uh, and all those silences are also still apparent. And yet, this is, I mean, I'm, I've been so inspired by not only your book, but also, you know, documentary uh, filmmakers like Lonnie Ding and Ancestors in the Americas. I mean, it, it lays it out so beautifully to kind of think about who was here and when, and also why. And we can consider how Asians are lured by capital to come to those plantations and to those fields. Um, But then they're also, and this is part of the contradiction that that scholars like Lisa Lowe point out, they're lured by capital, they're attracted by capital, but then they're also expelled by racism um, when when they're deemed um, unassimilable or unwanted. And so I think we see these cycles that go that play out in US history. Uh, And and we can trace it to things like the gold rush of 1848, you know, attracting uh, labor, capitals attracting labor to those gold mines. But then by 1875, you have the Page Act. And it's one of the first times that uh, an immigration law is now formally excluding people by race. And here it's targeting Asian women. Um, And that becomes the dress rehearsal for 1882. Um, And so again, you think, well, if now Chinese labor is is now banned, you still, capital still has to require labor. So another major group comes, Chinese, uh, Japanese are coming um, to work on those fields. And then by 1924, again, another major exclusion. What what do you think about this? Because we we keep moving forward to things like the Tidings McDuffie Act with Japanese incarceration, the Korean and Vietnam War. There's an endless kind of cycle of of, um, of this kind of history, which, um, uh, which is anchoring Asians at the same time, um, they're incredibly precarious when they find themselves here. Well, absolutely. I mean, as you um, describe those different cycles and laws, you know, that, um, and the first major migrations of, of capital and labor to, uh, to this hemisphere from Asia, um, you know, that really sets up the situation that unfortunately isn't all that different today of, of um, being brought here under the guise of being useful, you know, basically to be used by the really big, um, you know, industrialists, capitalists, plantation owners, uh, all of those things. And then when, you know, the Asians are no longer and, and never actually becoming um you know, never being equal, you know, no matter how rich some of these, you know, um, uh, labor, uh, you know, because there were Asian people who, who were the middle guys who brought over the labor, right, um, from the different Asian countries uh, to work in the fields and the plantations and so forth, or the railroads. Um, they were never actually equal to the capitalists who were employing them. So they were basically tools. And so people who came over thinking that, well, okay, uh, there's a famine going on in China. So let me see if I can find work, you know, in the, in the, on the railroads or whatever in the US. Um, you know, there comes a point where then they become, you know, expendable and not only, ex- I mean, expendable in the very way that they could be disposed of. Like in the, you know, you had mentioned the, 1875 Page Act that um, barred Asian uh, Chinese women from entering and then followed by the Chinese Exclusion Act and then all these subsequent acts that barred all Asians, you know, basically 
um, was a part of ethnic cleansing that took place in the Americas to get rid of these Asian workers who were useful to a point, but you know, really can't be, um, can't be uh, fully accepted in this country, can't be part of the democracy. And in fact, all of those laws, they were finally stripped away by 1952. And a lot of people say, well, you know, Asian Americans culturally, we just don't want to get involved. You know, um, that's why we're not so active in uh, politics or the school board or we don't speak up. And it's kind of like, no, come on, look at Asia. Is there any reason to think that the people of Burma today, the people of Hong Kong, the people of any number of countries all throughout Asia who, who fight tooth and nail in their own countries suddenly, you know, were culturally quiet people? That is just right. so not true. Right. But when in America, white supremacy, which is the root of all those laws that you were talking about, Theo, um, prevents people from even becoming naturalized citizens. What does that mean? They can't ever vote. They can't ever run for office. They can't be part of the democracy. So that's like 1952. So what we are seeing in terms of, you know, communities that have not had a chance to develop and mature in terms of political empowerment. And, and um, you know, that has been an enforced thing, you know, using Asians in one way to be, you know, labor or, um, or to fill in, uh, the lack of health professionals and or or other scientific people and do that kind of targeted immigration um, for Asian Americans, especially after 1965. And I don't think it's all that different today. I mean, I call, you know, the coolie labor of the 1800s has now become the high tech coolie labor because you hear stories over and over again in tech companies and Silicon Valley of the you know, quote, bamboo ceiling, where people who are highly trained and skilled people who can never make it beyond training their own supervisor over and over and over again, and, and are so frustrated, you know, because they're not viewed as um, leadership. But not only that, they're not even viewed as fully human, and certainly not fully American. So um, we see many instances of that, or targeting of people as being, you um, always suspected of being spies or terrorists. Mm -hmm. That is also part of our, um, uh, the way Asians are framed in America. So um, yeah, we see that cycle over and over again, but the difference today is that our numbers are so much greater and our positioning of, you know, generation. So, you know, even today, um, two to one Asian Americans are, um, born elsewhere. But that means one out of every three, 30 some percent of Asian Americans have are, are generationally have been yeah. here for, you know, were born here and see themselves more as American as opposed to, you know, the country of origin. And so with all of these voices, you know, 22 plus million we really can turn this around and change this and stop this cycle of manipulation being used, having some people uh, among the Asian American community thinking, well, it's better, at least I can, at least I can get ahead this way. Um, you know, if I keep my head down and never speak up, but I think mm -hmm. we're at a time today where we can't do that because, um, yeah because of Atlanta and what's happening in the world. We can't yeah. afford to do nothing because that's just exceeding to the, the white supremacy that mm -hmm. is um, at the cause of these attacks. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems we've got a lot of histories to, to learn and also many histories to unlearn um, that, that's really part of the work. And it's really not just Asian American studies or ethnic studies or labor history. It's really about American history um, the hemispheric history, America, um, in terms of its of its whole hemisphere. So there's, it seems like uh, we we seem to be going through a reckoning with multiple histories and multiple ways to tell those histories, like the 1619 Project or these films by Raoul Peck, um, and the toppling of statues that you've probably seen. Of course, um, we have a question from a viewer, uh, Paula from Kaneohe wants to know 
what would the real reckoning with this history look like, Helen? How would it change not only the Asian American communities, but also how would it change the country if we really taught and shared and actually absorbed this history as a, as a nation? What do you think about that, Helen? I think that question is really about what, how would it change if Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders were really visible in, in terms of other people um, outside of our own communities really saw us, really saw us in terms of, of, of what our roots are. And, and of course, Pacific Islanders and indigenous people have a very different relationship to, to the land and to migration than Asian Americans. But um, that's what I mean. If we were all really seen by each other as well, knowing, um, knowing our sense of belonging here, that, that our children, had a sense of belonging and that other people wouldn't be like, oh, you just got here yesterday. Or so now you know what racism is like, you Asian American people. And you, you know, mm. or the whole idea about being always a foreigner or that, that we have no real, well, what is our place in black, brown and white? You know, where do we belong in there? If we were really seen and being seen means we have to define ourselves. We speak up about who we are and that we don't depend on Hollywood to create who we are. Then um, in my view, it, it would change everything, you know, to you, this idea of a beloved community, that we would be part of a community. We wouldn't just be these Asians who just landed here yesterday or, um, you know, and, and they should go back where they came from. Um, if that was rooted out and there was a real understanding that we actually could say who we are and expect people to, to you know, take that in and respect that you know, for our full humanity and not just see us all as kind of all lumped together, um, that would be huge. And I think and you I think, said it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you said it. You, you said it, Helen. Um, the idea of of to be fully human. I, you know, this is this is the this is the thing that is to be combated. I think it is to resist the demonization, to resist the idea of not being fully human. Uh, and we could see parts of ourselves probably in Hollywood films. We could see parts of ourselves in on the covers of magazines, um, but they're also distorted. They're incredibly limited. Sometimes they're fantastic. Um, but oftentimes they're, especially in the case of Asian women, hypersexualized, right. uh, um, or in the case of men, emasculated or hyperviolent. And while that might be some, it might bear some resemblance to some people some of the time, that's not who we are fully. And, and I think, you know, the majority audience out there can, can um, appreciate the idea of what it means to be fully human when they see a range of characters. And I think that's, that's what it means to be fully human. You see all of the faults as well as the, the pride uh, of, of who you can be uh, to be fully seen. And um, I, I guess what it, what it does is it raises for some questions in, in the present, some maybe some ways forward to, to think about. And a, a question here is, is coming from, um, from Mike in, in Hawaii, and the idea about data disaggregation. Uh, why, is, why is the idea of data disaggregation important? This is kind of a wonky question from Mike. Why is that data disaggregation important for Asian American communities? We've, we're spending a lot of time talking about the idea of building a community, a racial community, a pan-Asian community. And at the same time, we're also talking about taking things apart ethnically. Why is, why is disaggregation important from the perspective of invisibility, for example, and, and getting into the, into the nuts and bolts of how communities are actually living? Well, it's critical because um, you know, within our communities, and I, you know, we say Asian American community or Asian American Pacific Islander community, but we know that actually it's multiple communities from all different backgrounds, cultures, linguistic um, uh, religions and heritages. And so, um, you know, under this rubric of Asian American, we have the widest wealth gap, the income gap of, of any group. You know, there are some who are doing fabulously well, and then there are others who, you know, in our communities 
who are really suffering, you know, the essential workers, the people who have food and housing insecurity, um, um, just the whole range of, of differences within our communities. And when we are already invisible, that when we sort of pop up, it's kind of like we're all lumped together. And I mean, that's why we know that, uh, for example, the vast majority of people who have been attacked in this, you know, uh, t- intense period of anti-Asianness, the vast ma- majority are are not Chinese, you know, mm-hmm. and um, and the majority, the ma- vast majority are also women or the most vulnerable people in our communities. And so, if we really want to be seen, and also to see ourselves and know ourselves and know where the real the needs are in our communities, we we really have to break it down. I mean, you know, the experience of Pacific Islanders is is very different than a, you know, fifth generation Chinese American. You know, the just the uh, everything is different about our our histories and cultures and our communities. And we, you know, the little that's been done about disaggregating and looking at how um, different Asian American and Pacific Islander communities are affected by COVID, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. also been sort of disappeared and invisible from, you know, the, the reports that we hear on the news, you know, they, they, if they break it down at all, they talk about, you know, white, black, brown, and nothing about Asians, certainly nothing about Pacific Islanders. And, and we know, for example, that Pacific Islander communities have been devastated by COVID. And where do we hear about that at all? Um, and, so I know in Hawaii, there's a lot of work going on in, in Waianae, for example. Um, yeah, but to, which is to, why I'm glad you folks need to get a hold of this because this is this lays things out. Um, but go ahead, Helen, you were going to talk about Waianae because it's covered in, in this report. Right. But it really does go into saying how, um, you know, the different uh, income levels of the different Asian American communities and Pacific Islander communities really affect how even for you know, public health, it, it really uh, has an impact on education, on jobs, um, you know, housing, all of those things, um, the needs are different. And so how do we address the real needs of our communities? We can't do that unless we, you know, break it down. And that's what this aggregation is about. And I, and I do want to say there's, you know, various, uh, very conservative and right-wing movements that are attacking the desire of the Asian American communities and AAPI communities to disaggregate information. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of amazing that, you know, why stand in the way of just knowing better what the population is, but um, that's very important. You know, if we're going to fight for education or more resources to go into different part of our our communities, we have to know where we have to know which communities um, are the most vulnerable. Um, all of those things. So right. that's an important yeah. one. We have to fight for that. Yeah. You mentioned um, uh, the, the kind of dis- why disaggregation would matter, especially for healthcare workers uh, in the middle of this pandemic. You know, I, the Association for Asian American Studies just had their conference this past weekend, and, and I attended one of the, the panels there. And it was fascinating to see some research that was focused on Filipinos in healthcare. And one of the things that was shocking, the statistic was that while um, the registered nurse population, um, Filipino registered nurses are, are 4% of the healthcare workforce, and yet they're 30% of the COVID-19 deaths in that industry. So you can't get around that without thinking about some major disparities and why we need to hammer home the idea that all, uh, all parts of Asian America need to be focused, focusing their attention on this to really develop Absolutely. some real attention. And, yeah. and that's, that gets at the invisibility too. That mm. what, what you just said about 4% of the nurses, registered nurses are Filipino, but one out of three ha- is Filipino who's died, you know, in, in performing the nursing duties. I mean, that's an outrage. I, I really don't know why. Well, I do know why. It should be, you know, on the top of everybody's minds, you know, Asian, non-Asian, you know, that's, that's a, an incredible incredible disparity there, you know, an incredible tragedy. And what's being done about that? Why isn't it being talked about? I mean, this is the kind of thing that invisibility 
Um, this is why we must all talk about it um, and not let, um, you know, the differences that go on in our different parts of our communities, we, we have to shine a light on it because if we don't do it, nobody will. Definitely, definitely. And while it's also a contemporary issue, while it's happening now, and while it's happening in a disproportionate manner against one specific community, it, we can also link it to an early part of our conversation, which is how this is also um, um, the, the historical legacy of empire, isn't it? You know, with the idea of, of training U.S. nurses, uh, training nurses in the Philippines right. in, the, in the short years after the Philippine War. Um, and so we kind of Again, we have to make we have to be better at our history to understand these things relationally, intersectionally, uh, and and cross racially. So, I mean, the research is being done. Catherine Sidney Sachoy's book, Empire of Care, is a great example of how to make those kinds of historical connections. And the great sociological work that's being done by Jennifer Nazareno at Brown University is thinking about all of that interesting disaggregated data and how it matters to study healthcare. Uh, in this particular way. I want us to, to keep moving because we've got some other questions here. Let's take this, this idea of we're thinking about the disaggregated part of, of the way forward, you know, as, as we try to make our, um, our, our way through these issues. Uh, let's think about the other way that we've been uh, understanding Asian America, which is as a coalition, as a pan-Asian group um, and cross-racial and intersectional in that way. Um, you have these ideas about this, this notion about the presumption of unity versus the presumption of, of allyship. And I, 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 wanna, I want to uh, see if we can maybe tease that out for the audience, because it, it helps us to kind of think about what, what's really involved, uh, not just in 1982 with thinking about the v Vincent Chin case, to kind of reconstitute that. It's not, it's not about that. But what does it mean now to kind of think about organizing in the present day? What, is, what does Asian American organizing mean uh, for us in the present? You know, um, at different times in the almost 40 years since Vincent Chin was killed, um, um, and, and that being a time of organizing where, you know, the Asian groups, each one was too small to really have a voice. And we realized that we had to create a pan-Asian coalition and make it multiracial, multi-class, really reach out and build unity. And, um, and I've been asked in these years, you know, well, if something like that happened today, and I have to say what we're going through now is very much like today, how would organizing be different? Do you think Asian American communities would come together like uh, 40 years ago? And so that is one of the differences with the, you know, additional, additional 20 million, um, uh, you know, uh, AAPI people in, in the, um, you know, as part of the American, um, you know, democracy today, um, that brings a lot more differences too. So we're talking about disaggregation so we can understand what the differences are and the needs are of our communities, but it also means that political organizing um, for activists is like, you know, how do you reach out to people, bring them together where they have very different, you know, backgrounds, languages, and have a critical mass to stay within their own community. I mean, you know, we have little Saigons and little Tokyos and different, you know, and not only that, but when you talk about, for example, Chinese immigrants, it's going to be um, linguistic. You have a Fujian group, you have a Mandarin speaking group, you have the Toisan group. And so, so it's possible more and more for Asian American, especially Asian American and the immigrant communities to stay separate and still feel that they have a sense of belonging and not needing to reach out and join together. So I think that is a challenge. And then the other thing about, you know, um, unity. I, this came unity with groups outside of the AAPI, you know, if you call it a coalition or the, you know, the umbrella, um, is that in the, the lingo today is about allyship and, I've been in a lot of conversations about, well, how do we be allies with another group, another racial group um, in particular in these conversations? And it just struck me at one point that, you know what, in back in the day, but, you know, there was a time when, you know, there was an assumption that we are part of a larger community together. Mm -hmm. There was an assumption that unity is achievable, that we can join together with other 
communities and inside the word community is unity, right? Mm -hmm. And so that we're not separate, but we can work together to build that sense of unity and community. Whereas allyship is about, I'm different, you're different, you could be my neighbor, but let's see if we could be allies together because it's not assumed that we are part of one community. And I think that's a difference. And I think where that comes from is, you know, in these past few decades, we have really been in a very intense um, time of division where, you know, um, highly educated uh, institutes um, have studied how to keep people apart. And I mean, in Hawaii, we know the tradition in, of, of, who, of who works on a plantation and the migration, um, you know, and the, the bringing over of different workers was specifically to keep them divided. Let's not have too many of one kind. And we throw this group with that group, they'll never come together to fight for really improving all of their lives. Well, that's been going on today in a very, very intensive way. We can see from the last election, if we, you know, want to look at the ugliness that's gone on, you know, just even in the past um, four years, you know, all of that was just keeping people as divided as possible. So, so now we're at a point where people who are really fighting for the same thing for, you know, for justice and equity and inclusion and to all be treated as full human beings, um, are now being sort of seen as, you know, we're in different different buckets, in different tribes, and it's mm -hmm. going to be, well, can I ally with you because we're different? Mm -hmm. And I, I think we need to change that conversation and really think about, well, if we are all part of a community, a whole, how do we, you know, how do we come together, work through our differences so we can really build that beloved community and unify? And I, I think it's a different mindset, but I, I think, you know, we have to really um, disrupt this whole uh, and subvert, you know, these poisons that and toxins that we've been fed, especially, you know, in these past, um, past few decades. Right. I want to draw our viewers back to Helen's book from 2000 called Asian American Dreams. And if you look on page 310, uh, I want to recite a quote from you, Helen. From the Vincent Chin case to the Los Angeles riots, from the salmon canneries of Alaska to the ballot boxes of Hawaii, from the stage and screen to the college campus, we are a people in constant motion, a great work in progress, each stage more faceted and complex than before. As we overcome adversity and take on new challenges, we have evolved. Our special dynamism is our gift to America, and we transform as we transform ourselves, so we are transforming America. Helen, you said these words uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, do they still ring true for you today? I, yes, I, I think we still are. Um, you know, the basic message is that, you know, Asian American and Pacific Islander people have huge um, contributions as people to make to what is called the United States. And, um, you know, that's still happening. We still are evolving. It still is a work in progress. And we can continue to move forward as long as we're all willing to put in the work to, um, to really you know, build that beloved community, to be seen, to be visible, to not be manipulated, to define ourselves. And, and that is an evolving process. Um, we still have a way to go. Um, but it's happening and we can all be part of a really, really important, um, you know, important movement to make all of our different communities seen and be treated as full human beings. Helen, if, if it happens when it happens, it'll be because you helped to make it happen and you breathed yeah. life into, into that reality. Thank you so much for speaking with me today, Helen. And thank you, especially for all of you uh, for all of your work, uh, Lifetime's work. And thank you to all the viewers uh, who took time to send in those thoughtful questions. Thank you for tuning in and please join us next time. Aloha. Thank you, Theo. And thanks to all of you. Thank you.